when I first started looking out to see who was doing money work, there were a lot of men, there's a lot of white men, and mm -hmm. there are a lot of books, and there's still a lot of, you know, traditional money books, and they're teaching you about how to invest, they're teaching you about how to pay down debt, and basic money management, and a few other things, but that's, that's it, you know, mm -hmm. that's a general thing. Um, and that's all good, you know, that's part of it, but there's a lot more steps before someone would get to saving or investing in the stock market. And the other piece of it is that it completely la leaves out that for many of us, this is very emotional. Hey everyone, I'm Thais Skye. Welcome to Reclaim, a podcast for women by women on conversations that matter. Hello, hello, everybody. Thais Sky here. Welcome to Reclaim the Podcast. I am so happy to be back with another brilliant interview. Today I have with me Barry Tesler, and we talk about money and we talk about aging. But before I bring on Barry and have this amazing interview, I want to share a few things. First off, if you support the podcast through Patreon, thank you, thank you, thank you. I so appreciate it. Patreon is a platform that allows... Um, people like you to support projects like Reclaim. You know, I do all of the behind the scenes work for Reclaim. I, you know, reach out to the guests. I book the guests. I schedule the guests. I uh, interview the guests. I edit the podcast. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And so Patreon allows me to, ha to have this work be sustainable for me. And my eventual goal with Patreon is the money that I make in Patreon is going to go directly back into the podcast in terms of hiring out, in terms of getting support. And so I'm endlessly grateful for all of you who support the podcast podcast on Patreon. And if you're interested in um, being a part of that community, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Thais Sky. You can learn more about the podcast um, and about Patreon and how the whole system works. And you can donate as little as a dollar a month and everything counts when it comes to keeping this podcast sustainable for me. So thank you. Thank you to all of you who support the podcast. I am so appreciative. Um, other thing is I'm going to be um, opening up more time on the podcast to be answered your questions. You know, I've been um, a coach for, gosh, what is it, 10 years. I'm running my own business and I'm currently getting my master's in clinical psychology and I've taken so many trainings and certification programs um, over the past 10 years to support me, um, to support you really. And I want this podcast to be um, a resource for you, a guide for you and um, open up to answering your questions about anything that's coming up for you around um, money, around your worth, around relationships, around sex, around politics, whatever question you have, I want to make space to answer it. So please email me at info at com, and I will be uh, curating all of the questions and answering them here on the podcast. I haven't decided if I want to do that before the interview or do it as an additional episode a week. I'm still figuring out the logistics of it, um, but I am now accepting questions. So please email me at info at com. I cannot wait to hear from you and to hear what questions you have that I I can support you and answer. Um, okay, so let me read to you Barry's bio. Barry Tesler is a financial therapist, mentor, coach, mamapreneur, and the founder of The Art of Money. She has guided thousands of people to new, empowered, and refreshingly honest relationships with money through her nurturing, body-centered approach. Her methodology weaves together personal, couple, and creative entrepreneurial money teachings into one complete tapestry. She is the founder of The Art of Money, a global year-long money school, which integrates money healing, money practices, and money maps. Her work has been featured on Oprah.com, Inc.com, The Huffington Post, U.S. News, and World Report, Routers Money, The Fiscal Times, USA Today. Oh my gosh, it just keeps going. The Cut, Girl Boss, Nerd Wallet, The Simpler Dollar, Red Book Magazine, Experience Life Magazine, and Mindful Magazine. Whew! Barry is also the author of The Art of Money, A Life-Changing Guide to Financial Happiness, published by Parallax Press. And you can learn more about Barry by going to barrytesler.com. 
Com. What I love about Barry's work is the body-centered approach, and we're going to talk a little bit about what that means in this episode, and we're also going to share, um, hear more about Barry's journey of stepping into um, being a financial therapist and what that means for her. Um, but the reason why I wanted to have Barry on is because I think the conversation of money is so important, and the more conversations with money that I have with my one-on-one clients, the more I learn that we do not talk about money with people. It's like we have so much shame around what we've internalized about how we can handle money or how we can handle and navigate our debt or, you know, our expenditures and how we spend money that we do not want to ever talk about money with other people because we're terrified of their judgments. And so we live in isolation and we live in a lot in a shame isolation where we feel like we're so alone um, in how we navigate money. And the antithesis, right, the opposite of shame, the way that we navigate this is by talking about it with other people. And I wanted to talk about money with Barry. And I want you to be having more money conversations. Um, I know that we live in a culture that says that it's rude to talk about money, but I actually find it fortifying. Here's what's so interesting about this idea of that talking about money and how much you make is considered rude in our culture. You know, money... Uh, women traditionally make less than men, um, Latina women even more so, black women even more so. Um, and so isn't it, isn't it um, what is it? Isn't it um, convenient? That's the word. Isn't it convenient that we're not supposed to talk about money? Because then we don't really know how much less we are making than our male counterparts. It's like we get to be a participant of our own oppression by not talking about it. And so one of the ways that we can break through this inequality barrier is to be talking to our colleagues, talking to people in our jobs of how much we make. We have to allow this information to be more open. There's no rules that says that you can't talk about money. It is all a cultural narrative that we have to question. And so I've been talking about money more, you know, um, not just like how much money I made as an entrepreneur, woohoo, but like my debt and my experiences with debt, and my experiences with um, breaking through some of my fears around money, and how I've created a new relationship with money. And if this is of interest to you, actually, I'm I'm happy to do a whole episode on this um, because I have a lot of thoughts, and I I think one of the the thoughts that I um, that is is prevalent to me right now is that because I had so much shame around money, not only did I not talk about money, but I was very afraid to look at my money. You know, I was very afraid to look at my finances, to really look at where my money was going. Um, And again, this is a way that is very convenient that if we don't look at our monies, if we stay, you know, not involved in our money, um, well, then who's really benefiting from that? If you think about it, it's the credit card companies. If you think about it, it's capitalism. And so looking at your money invites us to really expand our capacity to be with uncomfortable uh, emotions around money. But it's also extremely liberating because once we start to see where our money is flowing in and out of, we get to make different decisions if that's how we choose. I'm not saying budget. I don't always necessarily think that budgeting is the right thing. Sometimes it is. And sometimes I think it's just like counting calories. It's only perpetuating some pretty problematic Um, things that are going on underneath the surface. But I do think that it's important for us to be looking at at least where our money is going Um, and asking ourselves, this is something I do frequently, is like if I'm spending money, like why am I spending money on this? Is it because I really want it? Is it because it feels good? Is it because I feel like I have to? Like what's the underlying energy around spending money? And I do my best, this doesn't apply all the time, but I do my best to make sure that the things that I'm buying are the things that are going to add to my life. They're not things that I just want because everyone else has it. It's not just because it's trendy or fashionable, but it's because it's also going to give me something beyond just having a thing. Being more mindful and intentional around money is a way that we start to slowly um, discredit capitalism because capitalism functions by our unconscious spending. Um... So some, 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 just some things for you to be thinking about. Um, let me bring Barry on. And as you're listening to the interview, I would love for you to be thinking about what's your own relationship with money? You know, what's your relationship with money and your partner if you're in a relationship? And how does that work out? Um, and what would you like your relationship of money to look like? Hello, hello, Barry. Thank you so much for being here with me today. 
Thanks so much for having me, Thais. I'm really looking forward to this. I am not sure how we connected. I know that we connected through Facebook and I've been an admirer of your work, um, but I'm not actually sure how I stumbled upon you and your work in the first place, but I'm so glad that there is somebody out there doing the work that you're doing around money um, because it's such, it's such a big topic for so many people and it means so much to so many people. And the fact that you're in there in the trenches doing this for as long as you have, it's really, it's amazing to, to be a part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, will, I, I was called. I felt like it's a point. I didn't have a choice. And yeah, it's been really good work, really satisfying work. Mm, I, yeah, I, I guess that's where I want to start. Like, why money? Like, why, why money? <laughs> why money? Yeah, so for me, I, at the age of 23, I took myself to Israel for a year. Mm. I wanted to understand what it meant that I was born into a Jewish family. I wanted to understand that more. And in that year, I explored a lot of different things. And um, at the end of the year, I was jogging one day out in this kibbutz in a big field. And I, in a flash, got this idea to integrate all the dance and movement that I grew up doing with psychology. Mm. Yeah. I really thought I made up a whole field. I, you know, I thought I made up dance movement therapy or somatic psychology. And then I get to Jerusalem and learn, I didn't make up anything that there's graduate programs, <laughs> you know, in somatic psychology and dance movement therapy. And I chose to then come back to the States and move to Boulder, Colorado and start graduate school in somatic psychology and train to become a therapist. And mm. I spent a decade or a little less than a decade, um, you know, in graduate school studying every topic under the sun, um, except for money, but I didn't realize that at the time. And I really thought my topics would be sexuality and sensuality and body and food and intimacy and grief. Mm -hmm. And I spent, you know, all my internships and work in the mental health field and leading authentic movement groups and working in hospice from all sides. And, you know, at the age of 28, my school loan came due. And I just, like, freaked, I just freaked out. You know, I just flipped out. I, it was a moment when I suddenly realized that the theme, the topic of money was completely left out of my graduate school program. Mm. And shocking to me, how was I going to work with couples around money? If on the surface, that's supposedly the biggest reason that couples get divorced. And wait a second, what about my own relationship to money? What, what is it? And do I even know how to do bookkeeping if I'm going to start a private practice? And it just was such a huge missing piece. And I thought I was alone like many of us do. I'm like, I'm the only one who is shame around money. I'm the only one who has money issues. Mm -hmm. And then quickly I started looking around realizing I'm clearly not the only one in my community from all different lineage and economic backgrounds and income levels. We all had money stuff. We all had strengths around money. We all had challenges. And, you know, it was a moment where I really thought, oh, I'll just go travel the world and become a nomad and not face this, you know, and not pay back my student loan. I'm just not going to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And pretty quickly I realized that's not my style. That's not my way. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to take it up as a challenge, as a topic, as a theme and learn every single thing that I can on every single level that I can. And that's how it began. I mean, there's, there's more to that story and there's a mentor that I met and my own work that I've been doing for years and years. Um, but you know, a little interim is that I did start learning bookkeeping and it kind of blew my mind that I could do it and then I would enjoy it and actually I, I then fall in love with it. And, yeah. you know, I was not good at math growing up and I'd somehow equated if I'm not good at math, I can't do money mm -hmm. or I could certainly not do a bookkeeping system. And so I started learning bookkeeping and then I wound up having, a bookkeeping business practice for therapists and artists and coaches. And, you know, they just threw their bookkeeping at me. 
They could care. They, they had no clue. I had a master's in psychology. They didn't even know that they just did not want to have anything to do with their bookkeeping numbers and threw it at me. And I felt I was 28 to 32 years old and I wasn't ready to be a therapist. I felt way too, I just felt too young. Yeah. And this was the perfect transition work and business. And my God, did I learn so much about people's relationship to money and their numbers and their cash flow and what's mm. important to them by doing bookkeeping. Um, and then at some point I realized it was time to integrate all my past training as a psychotherapist with the language of money and the systems that I was surprisingly falling in love with and decided to create a whole methodology. And that was 18 years ago. Wow. We don't often see people who are in a thing 18 years ago still be in that thing, which yeah. is amazing because I know that that means that you offer, you've seen so much. And so your work is so nuanced and embodied and full of knowledge and insights from, you know, how, everything that you've seen in the past almost two decades. I'm someone who likes to walk the same mountain range over and over and over. <laughs> I just go deeper and deeper. And I, I, yeah. I do walk the same mountain range. My husband's always like, let's go on these trails over here. And I'm like, nope, you know, let's go yeah. here, um, to Mount Sanitas. And well, every day is different. And we see something new each day. And, you know, I just was someone who 18 years ago, um, I had a mentor who said, who was helping me. She knew I was trying to integrate my past training and my 10 years of training as a therapist with all of these new bookkeeping systems. And one day she just said, it's time for you to give a money talk. And I was like, what are you talking about? You know, mm -hmm. that's terrifying to me. And I like working with one person or maybe a couple, but I don't like to speak in front of a lot of people and no, you know, and she was mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's time. And I just went out into the woods and I ask a lot of questions when I'm walking and hiking and sometimes I get answers and sometimes I don't. Um, but that's one of the places I go. And I just said, what am I supposed to bring back, you know, to my community? How can I do my own money work? What are the, what's a framework? What are phases? And I wound up coming back and I lived with my husband in a 350 square foot cabin um, in the Redwoods in California at the time. And he threw up white paper and we just together put together this beginning methodology and curriculum that then I used to teach in tiny groups of 10 people over and over and over live mm. all over the Bay Area. And then, you know, I got to see what works, what doesn't. I got to realize, oh, I left out forgiveness. How, how did I do that? But I did. And let's add that in. And it was just a fine tuning and trying over and over and over and creating a body of work that could mature as I matured Mm -hmm. And the community matured and so on. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, something that I see come up a lot um, in my work with my clients is I don't feel like I'm very good with money. You know, I don't feel like I'm, I'm competent with money. I feel like I can't trust myself around money. And I'm sure you, get, you hear that often. And I would love to hear your insights on what do you think that phenomenon is about? Like, why do you think women have such a sense of distrust with themselves and money management? I could answer this on many levels. So I'll start with one is that most of us did not receive a financial education growing mm -hmm. up in small increments from grade school and up, you know, so we weren't given a financial education. Um, in school, I had one accounting class. I don't know if you had any money or bookkeeping or accounting classes, did you? I had a personal accounting class in high school. Okay. But it taught us how to, the only thing I remember from that class is learning how to track the stock market. Oh, interesting. Okay. So here's another thing is that, I, and I'm going to, I always have many threads, but when I first started looking out to see who was doing money work, there were a lot of men, there's a lot of white men, and mm -hmm. there are a lot of books, and there's still a lot of, you know, traditional money books, and they're teaching you about how to invest, they're teaching you about how to pay down debt, and basic money management, and a few other things, but that's, that's it, you know, mm -hmm. that's a general thing. Um, 
And that's all good. You know, that's part of it. But there's a lot more steps before someone would get to saving or investing in the stock market. And the other piece of it is that it completely leaves out that for many of us, this is very emotional, right? Or it brings up emotions. And so for me, why, you know, in my 20s, I trained to be a somatic therapist was was because emotional literacy was such a missing piece in my life. And I Mm. was dying for it. You know, literally, I feel my graduate training, which taught me how to listen to my body again, which I just was overriding like so many women for so many years um, to learn how to listen again. I remember like being on the floor in authentic movement class when I had an awareness that I could know when I was full or when I was hungry. You know, I think I was 22 or 23 and it just blew my mind, you know? And so financial literacy and emotional literacy are two really big missing pieces. Mm-hmm. So one, we're not given a financial education. And then our par- most of our parents don't have a healthy relationship to money or they know parts and pieces, but they don't know the full picture. So they can't pass things down if they don't know how to do it, you know? Um, and so, and then there's the emotions that, and it, all the same set of emotions come up in any other big topic of life or, you know, that I already mentioned all those topics. Mm -hmm. And so there's this piece around, um, just for women, somehow we even learn how to, um, cultivate and fine tune our intuition. Um, and there are all these other like practices that I was living in, in my late twenties, but somehow they're all separate from money for me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I wasn't supposed to, as a therapist, strive for money or want money. Oh my God, you know, that's wrong. Um, there was a lot of spiritual community people around me, a lot of Buddhists, a lot of Jewish Buddhists in my community. Um, and you, again, you're not supposed to strive for money. You're not supposed to want money. There were just all these mixed messages, but for many of us as we're going up, you know, we're not learning all the parts and pieces of the financial part and then the emotional part. And somehow we think that we just need to make money decisions from our head um, and our mind. And, you know, the very first tool that when I started creating my methodology that I brought from my decade of training as a somatic therapist was let's check in with our body, Mm -hmm. you know, in all the daily money interactions, let's stop and pause and, you know, when you're going to have a money conversation, stop and check in and physically what's going on or what are the sensations or what's the emotion or where are you breathing or where's your breath really shallow. And for some people, that's really um, natural. And for many of us, it's like, wait a second. And for me, that's what starts bringing in our intuition is let's learn how to stop and pause and be okay that we may have a strong sensation that we may have a strong reaction, that we may have a strong emotion in all of these money interactions. And most people I know feel, or many people I know don't feel comfortable with money, feel like somehow everyone else learned this, but we didn't. Or we feel like if we just came from a different economic class, we would have learned this um, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, I've been hunting for a therapist here in LA and I've, gone to three in the past, I would say, five months, and I finally landed on one. And it's been really interesting to observe how each of them handle pricing and talk about, you know, what they charge. And the therapist that I finally landed with, she didn't talk to me about her rates and what that, and, and as if it's like a definite thing. Right. Her invitation was, all right, let's just talk. What does the money mean to you? What is your money situation right now? How do you feel about your money situation? And we actually had a whole session on money before we even talked about, okay, well, let's talk about what type of um, fee we should set that's based on both your needs and my needs. And that felt so, such a bold, strong thing to do to sit in the discomfort of talking about money, both holding the frame for somebody else to be talking about money, but also be holding that frame while you're talking about money for your services, you know? And I, I love that that's how she approaches 
creating these conversations with people. And it really emboldened me to open up even more to how I'm having conversations with my clients about my money, you know, how, what I charge and, and what that looks like, because this isn't something that we have to tiptoe and it has to be this definitive price point or else you're done and out. It doesn't have to be as scary as I think most of us are making it be. You know, that is an incredible story and may more and more therapists you know, take that approach. So, so many therapists have not done their own, their own money work because they don't know how, or again, it wasn't part of their training as well. You know, similar to all the financial folks, you know, they learn, uh, again, the language of money, they know how to do a tracking system, they know how to plan, but if any emotions comes up, they weren't taught any of that part, you know? So this conversation that this therapist initiated how powerful and wonderful and what's the word and brave because it's also most therapists, you know, it's not an easy model, you know, charging an hourly rate and having to get so many clients. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, you know, and things happen and you have to make your monthly nut and clients come and go. And so again, we don't know that we don't know the therapist Mm -hmm. financial situation or her, her background. Um, but how brave of her and how wonderful to be having those open conversations. So you came up with a fee and a pricing together. Yes. That's that's amazing. That's amazing. Based on, you know, what value she, she brings, but also what value I bring, you know, it just wasn't a, I'm the expert. This is how much you should pay me. Um, and that's it. It was a real conversation and it's of course not appropriate, for everybody and um, in every situation. But I think what I love the most about it was that there, here's another person modeling for me that talking about money does not have to be um, filled with this sense of unworthiness and this sense of anxiety and this sense of doom that I think many of us, whenever we even think about talking about money, carry. Yes. And, you know, for me, that's, that's just normal. You know, when people yeah. start to work, they, there's always some level of shame, mm. there's always some level of anxiety or anger that we have to even deal with this part of life or sadness for unmet needs still coming up from our childhood or, yeah. you know, I mean, you know, or checking out, wanting to fall asleep to hope and excitement you know Mm. but until we start to explore this terrain and what it is because we're all different you know some of us certainly have a certain set of emotions that comes up but usually different ones come up in different situations and yeah some people say to me talk about fear and money I'm like okay no you you tell me about Mm. fear and for you because if they pick out one emotion like that that's usually their main emotion that comes Mm -hmm. up but they're all part of it and also with the hope and excitement and, you know, but it's, it's an area of life that we can't ignore um, and that most of us are scared to even approach. We don't even know where to go or we know that we, or we've developed in so many areas and become adults in our, on our own terms, you know, matured in so many ways, but maybe still not with money. You know, my mm-hmm. community is 25 to 75 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a huge range. That's a huge age group. And many older women um, deciding to face money for the very first time for all sorts of big life moments or just smaller ones that have been sneaking up on them, you know, for years. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to switch gears in just a minute, but I have one more question about this. I would love to know what you typically see with couples and money, um, if there's any like large patterns that you tend to see between people and money, um, and what are some things that people should be thinking about when navigating relationships and money? Because I know that money is one of the biggest reasons why people break up, divorce, split up, etc. Um, and I would love to hear your thoughts around that topic. Sure. So that's the surface reason people just slap on money. It's about mm. money. But it's about what we've already been talking about. We don't know how to talk about money. Yeah. We don't know how to have loving, compassionate, um, safe conversations around money, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so for, you know, I've been with my husband almost, we've been together almost 18 years. Wow. Um, so 
we've been doing this work and now we've, we've a 10 year old son. So we're doing our best to do this work with him as well. Um, and so with couples, this is what was fascinating for me as I started doing this more and more is that, you know, two people come together and it doesn't even matter if they come from the same economic class, which not always happens, right. Or the same lineage with not always happens. Mm -hmm. Um, Everyone has different approaches to earning money and spending money and saving and giving and loaning and investing and so on, you know? And so you get two people who just do that very differently. And a lot of the times, I mean, sometimes we're on the same side, both um, with similar patterns, like we don't want to deal with this part of life. Can someone just take care of it? I see that every once in a while, but usually the couples polarize and one person Um, somehow claims that I'm really smart and I know how to do this money thing because, Mm. you know, I, I don't know. I went to, um, uh, I got my MBA or, you know, I, um, am am an an accountant or whatever, you know, whatever it is, they feel, Mm -hmm. they somehow claim that I'm the smart one. I know how to do this. And the other peer person feels more stupid or feels like Mm. they don't know how to do this area of life. And sometimes couples polarize that way. Sometimes couples polarize where one person really wants to pay attention, you know, it's more feels uh, the need to be hyper vigilant, you know, because of their story and their past and their history and their personality. Um, And the other person just wants to stick in their head and stick their head in the sand. Mm -hmm. So a lot of couples polarize in Mm -hmm. all different sorts of ways. One person is really open to risk. The other person isn't, you know, these are generalizations, but that happens a lot. Um, also what I see with couples a lot too, is that, you know, we were never taught how to sit down and have a money date and have a, what is even a loving, compassionate money date even mean? What does that even look like? You know? And so money conversations happen at all sorts of odd times and in odd moments. And, you know, I always tell the story of like someone opens up the credit card statement and then goes running to their partner going, what the hell, you know, like, yeah. why did you spend money this way? Or we're just horrified that we each spend in different ways. Um, or we try to have money conversations before bed. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. I'm guilty of that over the years. Like, it sounds like, it, I don't know if it sounds like a good idea, but it just like happens, you know, like, we, I, I, you know, over the years I wanted to talk about money right before bed and sometimes it works. Most of the time it doesn't, you know, or someone's in the shower and you're trying to have a conversation with, you know, mm-hmm. so I think that there's all, so, and many people have been together for years. Um, and then lots of things get swept under the rug where there aren't really direct, real conversations about, um, uh, what phase of life are we in? Who's staying home to take care of the kids? How do we feel about that? What about when one of us starts earning more? What about when the woman starts earning more? What about, you know, like mm-hmm. all these conversations. And so one of the things that I teach couples how to do is to start with the clean slate and to have beginning money dates again, no matter how you've done them over the years, um, you know, to to begin again. And I do this four phase Um, money date thing where the very first money date is a half an hour. You each get 15 minutes. You get to talk for 15 minutes. The other person doesn't say a word. (laughs) If they need to do body check-ins and sit with their feelings, wonderful, you know, Um, and then you switch. And that first money date or that first type of money date is just about storytelling, Mm. sharing what you learned from your mom, from your grandparents, um, from your lineage about money, from your religion? Um, what was your different role with your siblings? You know, um, most siblings, even if it's two or three or four, you all have different relationships to money, even though you were raised in the same household, you know? Um, I was a little spender right away. I was like, oh, there's candy that I want, or I want to buy my mom a ring at the school fair. And my brother had a bank at the age five, like he was saving money, you know, at five. And my sister saves too. We all have different roles. So just starting to have money conversations with your spouse. And this always surprises me because you would think if you've been together five, 10, 15, 30 years, you would know everything about the other person. But sometimes we don't know everything about their money story. Mm-hmm. And so I start there first, right? And we practice that for a while. And then you can move into phase two, which is talk about your values. And on the surface, they may be the same. 
But again, when you go to spend money or save or give, it can be totally different. And one of the stories I always tell is my husband's really into um, expensive bike gear. And when I first met him 18 years ago, he was a hippie. Like he wasn't, he was, he's changed. We've both grown and changed. And now he's, he's on a cycling team and he trains a lot. And when he came to me to buy a road bike so many years ago, I was horrified. I was like, I don't spend money like that, you know? And he was like, well, I don't spend money like you do with massage and acupuncture and facial lotions. <laughs> and I said, Too pay, you know, and then we actually like, we had made, we made a whole deal and agreement about him getting the bike. And then, you know, we tracked our numbers like we love to do. And we added up my side for a few years of all that acupuncture and facial lotions. And he added up his bike and it was pretty much equal, you know, yeah. But so that's the whole second conversation is about values and what's important to you and what's different. And then the third phase is when you actually start talking about the numbers and who's going to track and, you know, and all of that. And, And then the fourth phase is all about getting on the same team to make larger decisions, to make good money decisions, to talk about larger goals. I mean, that's a really simple thing about it, but it's couples, you know, when people say to me all the time, even my publisher for a second book said, will you write about money and kids? And I said, nope, <laughs> you know, no way, because my son's 10. Mm-hmm. And maybe when he's 18 or 20, you know, I feel like I still have so much to learn. But I was going to write a second book about couples, and that's not what I'm doing anymore because the couples, you know, each person I always say needs to go off in their own corner to do their own work. Um, what do they do? What are their strengths around money? What are their challenges? Um, you know, do they know how to use a bookkeeping system? Like step one is always the body check-in to be practiced, you know, when you're going to look at your numbers and have money conversations before, during, and after. But step two is always learn a bookkeeping system and get help, get a trainer if you need, and start to really know your numbers and patterns inside and out. Without judgment, just like study it for a few months and then you can make changes down the road, you know? So with couples, it's like, most parents don't know um, how to manage their money or don't understand their own emotions. And so I always say, go off in your own corners, then come together, start having these new money dates, and then you can start passing down different things to your children. Thank you. Wow, that that was really, really helpful. You know, I I think money is one of those things that the more that we can look at it, track account for and 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 see the pattern of where it's going you know the less shame there is now i always say shame can't exist in the light and money is one of those things where especially in relationships if we are sitting down together looking at things together talking about them and appreciating like you and your husband have appreciating each other's differences you know my partner may love to go out for lunch and instead of getting upset with him, well, why are you going out for lunch so much? You should be packing lunch. Ask him, what are you getting out of that? Maybe the reason why he loves going out to lunch is because that's when he gets to spend time with, you know, colleagues and, and de stress. And, and if you pack the lunch, then he feels like he has to eat at his cubicle. And so there are so many things that are about money, but not about money. And, and looking at money together is a great way to learn more about each other and cultivate deeper intimacy. So thank you for sharing that. That was really beautiful. You're welcome. Something that um, you mentioned before we started recording is that you're having some insights around turning 50 and you've been sitting with that and that's been exploring what that looks like for you. (laughs) And I would love to hear what's been coming up for you. Yeah. So I am less than two months from my 50th birthday Mm. and it just feels powerful. It feels um, potent. It feels, you know, we are our age, we are not our age, and yet 50 is a big one. You know, yeah. it's, just, it's, you know, I like to mark uh, decades. And, you know, right before my 40th birthday is when I gave birth to my son. Um, my 40th, you know, in my 40s, I um, wrote a book, my first book, The Art yeah. of Money. Um, that's something I wanted to do from like day one. And people would ask me really the very first talk I gave, when's the book coming? And I would say soon or one day, you know, and that was huge, a huge undertaking. Um, you know, just to, just to be a mom, 
I, I, I made it until 38 with being very clear I was not going to be a mom and that that was not my path. Oh, interesting. And then, yeah, and my husband and I were together for seven years. And on our first or second date, we signed the invisible contract of no kids, no kids, you know. And then I just woke up in my 38th year and something changed from inside. And wow. It was, yeah, and I had been doing my work for seven years. Um, I had had a whole team at that point. I had had a business partner and bookkeeping trainers and financial coaches under our umbrella. And I, you know, the only next step on my path was to have a child and to have a boy named Noah. And, you know, it took me all year to kind of drop seeds in front of my husband's lap that he was ignoring, you know, <laughs> and then, you know, at the very end of the year, I was literally in my garden one day and I'm not, that's not something I do, but we had a little garden in California and I was like, this is it. The train is leaving. I want you with me, but like, let get on it, you know, let's go to therapy. And we wound up doing six weeks of therapy. And I sat there very quiet. And when I want something, or when I'm clear about something, I can be really strong. My husband says, I can be like a freight train. But mm. I only pull that card um, in very particular moments. Um, I like the word Jaguar better than freight train. But <laughs> I can I just, you know, I'm just ready and I leap. But I sat there so quiet in therapy and he did his own work around his own father and how he's very different. And so why am I going back there? Um, I think just because I changed my mind, you know, right before my 40th birthday and then had my son Noah and he's 10 now. And so we're, we're heading into, I'm heading into 50 and a few things. One is that um, perimenopause and legacy. So Perimenopause began a few years ago for me. I'm still getting my cycle, um, but lots of symptoms. Um, and I'm, ch you know, I'm just changing and my body's mm -hmm. changing and my energy level is changing. And um, I've been really thinking about the spectrum of health over the last year. Um, and I don't even have a good word, for, word yet for sick to health or everything in between. Maybe you do. Um, but I've been. I, I finally found out that I had a staph infection all year on and off. And I was blaming so many things on perimenopause and mm. perimenopause has both been very powerful for me because it's my yes and no's are so damn clear, clearer than ever. Um, boundaries so much clearer, but I've been working on that for a good decade plus, you know, as soon as I had my son, it was so clear, you know, mm -hmm. um, no more pick my brain sessions, no more tea dates for free, you know, all that years ago. Um, so it's been very potent, but the change in my body, um, has been intense and the emotions have been intense. And so, um, so grateful that my acupuncturist finally discovered it was a staph infection and wound up taking really intense antibiotics and I'm through it. But now, you know, I'm realizing there's no like, Oh no, I'm healthy again. You know, it's such a spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so much going on in our bodies at all different times. And I, I don't, I don't want to be using that word now I'm healthy again, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's that. And with that, I've had to do a lot in bed um, this last year. And so any time it was like, well, will you do this? I was like, yeah, can I do it from my bed? What about a second book? Well, can I do it from my bed? You know, and I've done great work this year. And because I have an online community, um, we have a private Facebook group and I've been in there more than ever, you know, um, for this year. So there's interesting things around that. What can I do from my bed? Um, and being fine with that. I love my bed. Um, but there's this legacy piece that's really knocking on my door. And as I mentioned earlier, I used to teach in really small groups of 10 people. And I did that for years and then grew to 20 people and then eventually grew to 50 people. And I used to teach in six week classes and then nine week classes and three months and then six months. And then right as I was hitting 44, I finally had the vision for a year long journey, a year long program. And something was deeply maturing inside of me and I felt I was ready, the community was ready. And I opened it up and that year I decided to lower my price point, um, which, you know, I'm not in the coaching world, but I am as a therapist and I am more of a coach than a therapist. Um, 
and I lowered my price point so that it was more, or I hoped it would be more accessible to a lot more people. Mm -hmm. And we went from having, you know, I was pulling teeth for that year to get 50 students and we got 320 students Wow! uh, in my very first year. And so, you know, the revenue increased significantly. The group size, the container grew significantly. Um, I was over the moon and I just was ready. I had tons of relationships that I'd been de developing for years with. So I had guest teachers and now I have TA teaching assistants and we're heading into our seventh year. Um, and I haven't changed the price since the beginning, which is very important to me. That leads me to legacy. You know, what's, what does this mean? Um, what will be here when I pass? What am I passing on to other people at this time? What's relevant? Um, you, and so I'm sitting with two ideas and one is a second book um, that's on the table. But what's also on the table that I've said no to for years is women have come to me and said, Barry, will you train me in your methodology? And I kept saying, no, that sounds horrible. That sounds not fun for me. Or I don't think I would be good at it, honestly. And But women have, have been coming to me for years with this and then in the last six months, something started to shift in how people were asking, who was asking, how they were going to use the methodology. So one woman wrote in, who's been a part of my Art of Money year-long program for a while, and she said, Barry, I want to do a training with you because I want to help women get out of poverty. Okay. Um, another woman who's been a part of my community for years, born in Mexico, lives half in Mexico, half in San Diego, does real estate. She said, I want, you know, she's been in my community for years. I want to train with you and your methodology to learn how to use the tools more so that I can work with my Spanish speaking community. And I'm just getting requests that are like going straight to my heart, going straight to this deeper place of how I can serve. And there's other, there's a couple of other women who I'm friends with and colleagues with that I refer people to, she, you know, like go over there. She does a financial coaching or money coaching certification. And I've always sent them to my colleagues, but they're coming to me. And so I'm having to really revisit this um, and say, can I serve in this way? So we're about to send out a survey and say, number one, what do you hope this training will give you? How will you use it? Why do you want to do this with Barry when there are other money coaches doing this work? Mm -hmm. um, and so on. So that's what I'm sitting with. There, there's been legacy. I feel like we've reached so much more people because of the book, because it's $14, you know, on Amazon. And that can reach so many more people and people can gift the book and the whole financial therapy methodology is in there. Um, and then there's my program, which it's not, a, it's, it's not a high price point. It's not a low price point. It's kind of in the middle to low for online programs, you know, so it's accessible to so many more people, but not everyone. Um, so I'm just sitting with, um, I've always needed um, tiers to my pricing so that I could serve different communities. And now this piece around the certification keeps coming up. So that's, that's, that's a little bit. There's more. <laughs> yeah. I think it's so amazing that you're using, that this time of your life is really inviting you to sit with legacy and like what it means. I know so, so many women rather than focusing on legacy, it's almost like this fear of aging, this fear of becoming irrelevant, this fear of trying to maintain their youth versus, you know, how can we be using this time to deepen our roots so that when we die, which is an inevitable part of our lives, we can leave something that we're really proud of that feels in alignment with our lives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love this aging thing in many ways. You know, I love this maturing. Mm. Um, and, you know, there, there are certainly parts that have been challenging again, just the body changes and, um, I'm fuller now. Um, and, but I'm stronger too. I, 
you know, a year ago I started, I went into the gym and got a trainer mm. and now I know how to lift weights and do full routines, you know? And so I'm strong too. And yeah, I, I feel old and young at the same time, like old soul, but young. And, you know, I also have a 10 year old. So most of my girlfriends that do have children, they're in college. Um, I know a few that have grandchildren, you know, my age, and I have a 10 year old. So th there's also different life phases and stages happening in my household um, at the same time, which are unusual compared to maybe how it used to be or how, where I grew up in Chicago, how many women are doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, for me, I've, I love my work. And I, you know, as I, you know, I'm, I'm a Capricorn, I'm slow and steady and I'm going to be the mountain goat, like going up and down, and up and down. The same yeah. mountain range though. Mountain range. <laughs> Any final thoughts for people listening around money before we wrap up? Oh, wow. I mean, really step one is to practice the body check-in. Um, just stop and pause before you're going to have a money conversation, before you're going to look at your numbers, before you're going to pay a bill. Um, sometimes we remember body check-in in the heat of the moment when we're in the middle of like feeling furious or um, having, you know, any strong emotion. Or sometimes we think of a body check-in after, after we've bought something or made a money decision or bought clothes or, you know, we're at the car dealership or, you know, afterwards, it's also a body check-in is a great debriefing. Like, mm -hmm. how do I feel now? Um, you know, am I getting the value out of this thing that I just bought? What would I have done differently beforehand? And the second step is learn a bookkeeping system. And, you know, half the people come to me, if not more haven't and we feel embarrassed or we feel like we can't learn it and you know my husband one day just taught himself mint and i bank and you know that was never the way i was going to do it i needed someone to sit me down with a box of tissues and a lot of dark chocolate <laughs> slow and steady and just metaphorically hold my hand and it took many months some of us take six months to learn a bookkeeping system three to six months and then a year to feel comfortable and confident, you know? Um, so those are the two beginning steps and then start really learning your numbers and your patterns. And then the third phase is all about the money decisions and what phase of life and what are your dreams and goals and all that. And, you know, so those are a few beginning steps um, as you're diving into your relationship to money. I love it. Thank you so much, Barry, for sharing your insights with us. I really appreciate your time and your wisdom and best wishes for your big 5-0. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.